So I'd like to welcome you all back for the next talk in our series of Economics Beyond the Swabian Hausfrau. I'd also like to thank Robin McAlpine for taking his time this evening. Robin is from the Think and Do Tank Common Real. He'll explain that a bit, I think. Uh, let me get quickly uh, go quickly through the formalities. We would like to thank the Hilipanka uh, Foundation and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation who make these talks possible. Um, I wanted to announce the next talk is on the 24th of November with Julia Steinberger. It's about climate crisis and degrowth. Very, very good talk. I happen to have seen it last week here in Berlin. So the last point is normally at, I do say um, you can donate to Hella Panka via PayPal, but tonight it's, it's actually about our own fundraising. We do a fundraising at the end of every year. We've just begun it on the 1st of November. And we invite you to go to our website, www.bravenewyourup.com and donate. We are not supported by the state. We receive no money from any corporations or businesses. The website, I hope you know it and use it, uh, is financed solely by the readers. So if you can manage to go and to donate something, it would be greatly appreciated this year. We're trying to get the, the website onto a financial even keel. And we're asking people to do recurring donations. Our goal is 300 people at five euros or five pounds a month. If you can, it would be immensely appreciated because last year was a disaster due to Corona. Anyway, with that said, I'll just turn you over. Uh, well, wait a moment, one last thing. You of course can ask questions. We'll collect them in the course of the talk and go through them at the end. They're all in chat. So just if you have a question, write it in the chat. Can you do me one favor? Because um, Hella Panka doesn't do chats and questions. It's all in one thing. If it's a question, uh, do mark it as such. If it's a comment, which you're allowed to do as well, um, mark it also as such, because when we're going through them, I sometimes have to decide which, which it is. If, and sometimes you don't quite know the difference between a question and a comment. The other thing is uh, you can do them in German and I'll translate them to the best of my ability, but don't make them too long, please. All right, that's it. Robin, um, it's your microphone. Okay, right, fine. Um, so I'm assuming that that's all working now. I was just saying that it is wonderful to hear that progressive forces in the left, the world over, have the similar problem of identifying the difference between a comment and a question, um, something which we had wondered if it was only down to the British left. And I would also um, just reinforce what Matthew said about funding Brave New Europe. There aren't many alternative voices in Europe. And so uh, I think it is absolutely worth um, the, your five euros to support Brave New Europe and keep it healthy and strong for what comes ahead. Um, we need it. Okay, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about a project that we did um, as a think tank. I'm going to talk you through it, but the point I want to make tonight is less the one that I would usually make when I do this presentation which is, here's how we decarbonize Scotland. And I want to make it a little bit more general about the things that I and we learned while we were undertaking this project, what it tells us, I think, about how the world needs to start to think more um, about climate change and to suggest what that might mean for you, wherever you are. So. Let me try and draw that out, but let me just quickly first to say that common wheel, which is the, it's an old Scots, the same in English, for wealth shared in common, but with the joint meaning of and for the welfare of all. So that's the meaning of common wheel. We are a think tank which works right across the spectrum of public policy 
uh, economic policy, environmental policy, housing policy, social security policy. Um, so we do a lot of, uh, of different work, but we do also try to be fairly outcome focused. So um, for us, publishing a report is not a success. We continue after that with lobbying, campaigning, and we have many networks of supporters who we use to try and help us to, um, to do things because thinking isn't enough. We need to do things as well. So what did we do in 2019? Well, we started a project which we called our common home, unaware that the Pope was also using this name, um, to answer some questions which we felt were not being addressed in Scotland in the climate debate. And those questions were, can we actually do it? And if we can do it, can we do it properly and everywhere? So I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. But I just want to say that when we started this project, when I went in and we began with this project, I just genuinely didn't know if the answer to our question was yes, we can achieve the goals of this project using the powers and technologies that we have. And my conclusion at the end of it was, yes, we absolutely can. We can meet these ambitious goals with what we have. And I want to come back to that because it's really important. So what were our goals? Well, never lacking ambition, we decided that climate change, addressing climate change wasn't enough. Climate change is only one of seven environmental catastrophes that the world is going through just now. And in fact, my best guess is that climate change isn't the one that's going to kill us first. Um, I think water is probably going to kill us before climate change. And I think that the disruption that comes from natural resource misuse could actually cause a major global conflict before we even get to, in fact, you can argue it already has, um, before we get to the water. So what we said was, it's not just about carbon. It's about the full range of our environmental harm. And they're so interlinked, you can't really separate them properly. So consumption and carbon, you, these are not different subjects. They are interwoven subjects. So we said, can we reduce Scotland's impact across all of the seven environmental crises to zero? Um, again, I want to be really clear, not net zero, but absolute zero. Okay, so can we do that? Um, and how can we do it? And we set some pretty rigid rules, one of which was it has to use functioning technology. So there is no point in saying maybe in 10 years, maybe in 20 years, a technology will come along which will enable us to do this. It has to be something that we can do and that we know we can do now, with a couple of very small exceptions, which I will mention. The other really onerous task we set ourselves was that this cannot simply be Scotland's environmental impact in Scotland. It needs to be Scotland's environmental impact wherever that impact takes place. And so if it is the draining of water tables in Mexico to provide us with uh, avocados, knowing that this is going to kill the fertility of indigenous lands, then we have to address that as well. So all harm across all seven environmental catastrophes, anywhere it happens, reduce it to zero. So that's clearly quite a, that's clearly quite a, a demanding remit. And we also had from the very beginning, a very clear ideological and philosophical framework about how we're going to go and do this. And this is the first message that I think I really want to hammer to you, hammer home to really get across to you, uh, which emerges from this work. That this is going to perhaps at first sound slightly 
surprising or controversial. But in, I would argue that climate change and the other environmental crises are not global crises. The impact of them is global, but each of them is a local crisis. Yeah, this is a really important point. And I can't really emphasize this enough as I'm sitting in the country that's currently hosting COP26, where the received wisdom is, if we don't negotiate this between us and all do the same thing, then we can't tackle climate change. Now, I want to challenge that argument because while atmospheric carbon knows no borders, if you go and you look at where it's coming from, those are very border delineated. They're very specifically place related. So um, you can say it's a global problem, but it's a global problem that comes out of chimneys and comes out of exhaust pipes and comes out of badly insulated lofts and comes out of electricity generation plants. All of these sources, they it comes out of the consumption, it comes out of waste management, it comes out of how we do agriculture, it comes in places. And one of the, one of the big risks that I think we face as a globe just now is that climate change denial has morphed into climate change obscuritism. So I'm not quite sure how that will translate for my poor translators here, but we've deliberately tried to make it confusing to understand what it is that the world's got to do to tackle climate change. Um, so it's all done at the, the macro level. We talk about how many tons of carbon has to stop being produced or has to be absorbed somehow or offset somehow. But that is, that is really a distraction from saying, okay, but what is the human activity which is creating the carbon? It's not abstract. It is not a force of nature. Things we are doing are creating the carbon. We are doing them in specific places. And the vast majority of the activities which are producing this carbon uh, are under, are regulated and under the control of nation states, of national governments. The responsibility to take Scotland's carbon out of the atmosphere is not Barack Obama's. And um, I could do with one fewer lecture from Barack Obama who did so little when he was in power about what we should all be doing now. It is not the responsibility of India or China or um, developing nations and uh, or nations which are subject to mineral extraction by our corporate it's not their business it's not their problem it's not cops problem it's our problem we have to stop our houses leaking heat we have to stop generating energy using fossil fuels we have to stop throwing plastic into the environment as if it it, it doesn't have consequences these are our mistakes, our mess. And I cannot emphasize enough, again, if the world thinks that we can solve this without that single important truth, this is our mess individually as societies. It's our mess and we have to clear it up. Nobody else. And that's, the, that's the primary message that I want to say. Global warming is a local problem. It's a localized problem. And if we don't get local and take responsibility for that locality in our responses, it won't work. We won't be able to do anything about it. So that was one of the approaches that we took very early on was no hiding, no complaining, no blaming somebody else. This is us. All of this is us as a society. But that takes us on to the second factor, which is with the most vehement stress that I can place, as strongly as I can say it, this is not about individual action. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it just isn't. There is almost none of the really big challenges that we can meet completely individually. 
So if you want to try and reduce your impact to zero in the UK, in Britain and Scotland, you can't do it no matter how hard you try. Uh, our food is not produced sustainably. The food that's available, you cannot just choose healthy organic food all year round. It, it, even that isn't necessarily carbon neutral. You cannot just choose to do that. In Scotland, obviously, as a Northern European country, heating is a big issue. Um, it is almost impossible to take an old house in Scotland, an existing house, and retrofit it, particularly if you're in an urban area, and retrofit it to be entirely heat self-sufficient. It's almost impossible to do it. Um, these are the results of the structure of our economy, the structure of our society. We cannot expect these to be fixed on an individual basis. This is a system change or it won't change. And one of the things I found very dispiriting by this week observing COP is just how much the conversation is continually forced back to how it's somehow about us and our choices. And it isn't about us and our choices. It's about the system we live in. And that's the final point. The final point of the key messages that I want to get across is, despite everything else you've heard coming out of COP this week, the free market will not solve this problem. No matter what we do, no matter how we incentivize it, how we structure it, how we regulate it, or how we reform it, there is no profit to be made in insulating houses. It's expensive, it's labor intensive, it's time consuming, and it doesn't make returns. You save a bit in your heating, but given the cost of retrofit, so how much it costs to retrofit a house, you could be decades and you would never make your money back. So we have to do this collectively. We have to pay for this collectively. We have to meet it through taxation. And that is really the heart of our lessons is that these, it can be done if we take these approaches. If we do these things, we can indeed, we manage to get all of our negative impact almost to zero. And I'll whip through very quickly how we went about doing that. But I think the last thing that I should probably say by way of introduction is that we also took seriously the question of how do we pay for this? How do we manage this? How do we organize it? And to do that, what we did was we, did, we ran the, the, our proposals through uh, the standard e input-output economic model of the Scottish economy. And what we found was that if we, oh, one other thing, um, you can set targets all you want. You can set time targets, you can set number. That doesn't really mean anything if you can't actually deliver the work to the target. So one of the things that I keep saying to people these days is we can't decarbonize everything in 10 years. It will take at a reasonable, sensible rate in Scotland alone. It, I mean, and this is with a, we're projecting a workforce doing only this of about 15,000 people. Um, it'll take about 25 years to retrofit all houses in Scotland to get them to an acceptable um, insulation standard. And that was if we started tomorrow. You can only go at the pace at which you can actually deliver the work as you're going through it. And we need to be realistic about that. We need to be honest and say, well, if we wait 10 years, it'll still take 25 years to do it. So it's just going to take 35 years before we get it done. So we have to be realistic about the scale of this. If we do this right, we do it once. Now that, that's the other crucial element of this. If we fudge it, if we try and do little bits around the edges, we will do this twice, three times. If we do it right, it will last centuries. So this is a once in many generations piece of work. And I keep using the analogy of the Victorians um, building sewers. So if you said in the Victorian era, we are going to build a sewer, a sewer system, but we are going to ask each household to build their own 10 meters of the sewer, what, what would that mean? How would, you, how would you put a sewage system 
into in place in a city through individual action? The answer is you can't. And the same is true for the climate change. This is a once in a generation system change. And if we do it right, it creates the ability to pay for itself. So the short version of this is we calculated the numbers for, so first of all, we costed, and, and th this talk is called um, Start Counting, because my strong message is that climate change mitigation, environmental harm mitigation, it's a big engineering project. 90% of it is an engineering project. It's not philosophical, it's not market-based, it's just digging holes and putting things in the holes. And the fact that it is so clearly an engineering project really emphasizes the fact that before we can do anything, we need to measure, survey, assess, and count. It, it's not an abstract. We need to know how many pipes we need for district heating. We need to know how much insulation we need to do the houses. We need to know what kind of a size of workforce is required. We need to know all of these things. So we costed every element of our proposals, every single bit of it, and added it all up. And then what we did was we financed it over 50 years. So we're assuming that we pay this off over two generations, over 50 years. And if we do that, the annual repayment of the borrowing costs comes to about four billion pounds for Scotland. So that's about four billion pounds a year um, to get the work done. And we modelled the revenue that would be generated from taxation and from direct income. So we get, sorry, wait a minute, my apologies. The total annual cost is five billion. And then our modeling says that we would bring in about 4 billion of that from expanded economic activity. I would never see economic growth now, but, but the simple actions of carrying out this work will expand economic activity and create a lot of jobs and the taxation from those jobs and from capturing supply chains, which I'll come to as well, um, that would generate about 4 billion pounds a year, even on very modest assumptions. And we reckon there'd be another two to two and a half billion would be generated in other direct revenue. So for example, uh, our system would bring electricity generation and distribution into public ownership. So those, the costs of utility bills would then become um, part of the revenue. So if we do this right, we can do it all successfully and pay for it um, without, increasing long-term debt burdens. We, we, we would be paying for this work because of the action that the, that the work involves. So we did all of this work. We did it for a year. We worked with uh, experts in every field that we could find across the, all the seven areas. We asked them, what's the problem? What do we do? How do we fix it? And what does it cost? How do we measure this and how do we cost it? Um, it produced a book which we are calling The Common Home Plan. Now, you can get this, you can buy copies on our website, or you, but you can download it for free from our website, uh, which is common, uh, common Wheel, uh, W E A L, Echo Alpha uh, Lima, dot Scott. So you can download it, you can get all the numbers and all the details of what we did from in there, because I am glossing over a lot of the methodology of how we did this. So we, we produced it as this book. And as we were, completing it, we realized that it was forming thematic chapters. Now, what I'm going to do quickly, and I do mean quickly, is go through the themes, the 10 thematic chapters that we've got in the book. Robin, one you. moment before you start yep. that. We're changing interpreters. Great. One, two, three, four, five. Off you go. So, um, I'll, I'll whiz through the 10 chapters. And the reason for this is another lesson of this whole project for me is that climate change mitigation is not only local in terms of targeting the work, it is very local in terms of the natures of the solutions. So what works for Scotland will not work for Switzerland necessarily, will not work for Mexico necessarily. These are local solutions. So we've got lots of wind energy 
but not the best opportunities for solar energy. We've got enormous marine energy. We've got lots and lots of land, which means that we've got the potential for a lot of, of um, bioplastics, for example, in, in Scotland. So we have, specific, but, but it's cold and we use a lot of energy and our housing stock is in, in poor thermal quality. So every country will be different. That's why I say again, you need to start counting. You need to go through your where you are and start counting. So what were our themes? Okay. The 10 themes that ended up the chapters in the book, the first is buildings. And this is a big deal in Scotland, less so for much of the rest of Europe either because weather is, weather patterns are different or because you're just more sophisticated in your house building than us, which is pretty well everywhere in Europe. <laughs> so we, we've got poor housing stock. We need to get this up to thermal efficiency and there's no other way around it. We've got to go through a program of uh, retrofitting houses for insulation and in particular for draft proofing. So there's been a lot of loft insulation that's gone in badly, by the way, because we did it through free market. Um, a lot of loft insulation that's been put in badly in houses which have got bad draft problems. And so we just, they lose the same amount of heat, but they just lose it through drafts rather than through the roofs. So we've got to go through this and we've explained how to go about doing it and what it would cost. The key for Scotland is if we want to make this pay for itself, we need to start developing the supply chains domestically. We have so much potential for this. Uh, we don't actually produce organic insulation, house insulation in Scotland at all, despite our enormous forestry potential resources. So we've got to build the infrastructure to create supply chains. And I make no apologies for saying that some of this would look potentially in European Union rules, a bit on the um, protectionist side, but that's part of it here which is that we need to create the materials we're using domestically because we can't just keep shipping things to all around the world on big shipping containers when we are more than capable of making it locally. So you've got to make things locally. But incidentally, that's also how you create the economic um, expansion, which helps you to pay for the project. You need to capture the supply chains if you want to make that work. So um, housing is just a, a simple legwork. The big barrier for housing is we just don't have the workforce. I mean, it take quite, there's, there's a lot of skilled trades required and it would take some training. So we think it would take probably four or five years to get started properly on that, simply to get the workforce built up and the supply chains built up. The next, the next section is heating, which we separated out. Heating is a big problem for Scotland. It's, it's a cold, windy country, cold, windy, wet country um, with bad housing stock and we are more reliant on gas central heating, gas for our heating than any other European country. So about 95% of our heat load is carried by gas. Now, at this point, I usually go into a bit of an explanation about how bloody complicated this is. Heating is one of the most difficult things to solve. Every solution turns out to be very expensive. All of them, it doesn't matter, who, I mean, hydrogen's psycho expensive electricity by the time you've put in the you've changed the entire heating systems in the houses and you've reinforced the grid and you've added all the extra electricity generation um it, it's very expensive moving to air source heat pumps is very expensive so whatever you do with heating it's very expensive but there is one model of heating which for its expense gives you by far the best outcomes which is district heating so we've priced up and modelled a universal district heating system for the whole of Scotland, or at least about 70% of the housing stock can manage that. The rest, which would currently be off gas grid, would be using LP, uh, um, bio LPG, biogases, biomass, or uh, forms of local heat recovery. And then what we did was, so we've costed this, we've costed how much it costs to adapt the house, how much it costs to create the sub mains, how much it costs to create the mains, how much it costs to generate the heat. And we created a heat budget, which assumes that we will be able to supply almost all of our heat via, um, we'll be able to supply almost all of our heat from solar thermal, which in Scotland is much, much more efficient than solar PV. Um, from heat recovery, we have a lot of former mine works 
which have been flooded and therefore carry a lot of hot water. And then across our central belt, where we use most of our uh, energy, most of our heating, um, through biomass, through industrial heat recovery, and um, with the essential um, installation of a lot of interseasonal heat store, because obviously we get all of our heat at the wrong time. But we think we can produce a system which, once in place, produces almost cost-free heat for houses. Once you've put the infrastructure in place, all of these methodologies of generating heat produce heat with almost no cost, you know, pumping of water around the system. It's a massive job. It's a massive job. The most expensive part of the plan, and it's the most disruptive part of the plan. But we keep saying again, if we're going to spend tens of billions of pounds to do this in Scotland, do you want the one that lasts 200 years or do you want the one that lasts 10 years? Um, which will be the risk if we try to bluff it with the use of a lot of poor quality air source heat pumps. Right, the next one's electricity. Electricity in Scotland is just so easy. Um, we have so much renewable energy for our population that we don't know what to do with it all. So we can meet, right, okay, so to give you an idea, to meet all of our energy needs and current electricity usage, um, including and putting in storage, we need to roughly double our current deployed energy. Right, that's fine. To then <clears throat> um, electrify transport, to move to electric cars, and allowing for some expansion of uh, electricity usage over the years, we predict that we would need to about increase our currently deployed renewables <clears throat> by a factor of about three, so three times what we currently have. Quite a lot of that's already being installed. There's quite a lot coming to Scotland, but we can meet all of that with onshore and offshore wind. Onshore and offshore wind in Scotland can meet our entire electricity demand, even once that's expanded. And we, can, we have about somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of Europe's potential marine energy on top of this. We have so much subsea um, marine energy potential in Scotland that what we've actually proposed is we don't need it for domestic use. So what we've proposed is that we should um, move oil, former oil rigs down into the Firth of Forth, which, which is um, Murray Firth and Firth of Forth, which is between um, Scotland and mainland Europe, where the water funnels down at very high speed pressure, drop turbines and create offshore electrolysis plants producing truly green hydrogen for export. But this is what I mean. Other countries meeting electricity needs, more difficult. Scotland is so easy. Um, so that's uh, electricity. The next in the list is the one which is, I'm just going to skip over it largely because it is the one where we have the least knowledge, which is transport. So we know roughly how we're going to decarbonize transport, more or less, but the manner in which we do that, the manner in which we decarbonize that transport is not something that we're completely aware of yet. So we know small vehicles will be electric, um, small and medium vehicles will be electric, large vehicles are likely to be, and ferries and are likely to be um, hydrogen fuel cell. So we can put the core infrastructure in place, but, and I won't go into this just now, my personal view is that I think that the, the, the driverless technologies will come and that they will replace the current model of car ownership with an entirely different model. We will be, we, people will not own cars in the future, is my guess. But this is a really important question that we'll need to think about <clears throat> because if we aim to put car charging where people currently leave their cars, which is largely by the side of the road, this is another massively disruptive job. And if we do that much work, and then it turns out that's not where cars charge, we could have some difficulties. I'll just say one thing just, just in passing here about um, flying, air transport. That's the one area that we don't have a realistic solution to yet. We could move to, in Scotland, and potentially, we could move to using um, synthetic 
green synthetic aviation fuels, but it would be very expensive at the moment. And we can do internal flights soon with electric based aircraft, but a lot of the air travel is just, is, we, we just don't have solutions yet. And so what we've suggested is that we need to have a really serious think about workarounds. And one of the things that I favor is to say, right, you should get your summer holidays. And if you want to go your holidays, you get you know, two weeks, you can fly. If you choose to go by a hydrogen ferry, you should be given four extra days leave to, to cover the journey there and back to incentivize different modes of travel to try and um, get around this problem of, of flight. Right, jumping that quickly, moving on to food. This is, a, this is another really difficult one. Um, just because of our addiction to this global food system that we've got just now, irrespective of how vulnerable it is, and it's very vulnerable. Um, a couple of adverse weather conditions and some supply chain snarl ups, and we could lose large proportions of the globe's tradable food for a number of years with no difficulties. The impact of that would be monumental. I mean, we've seen them already in parts of the world. You cannot only eat good food. So there's no such thing as a reliable means of identifying what is produced sustainably and what isn't. So you can get organic status, but you can get organic status and still be draining the water table in unsustainable ways. We've looked into the options. What, what are all the things that you can do here? And it was, a, it was a painful process. Well, first of all, definitely we can clean up our act at home. So we've got to move to agroecology. We've got a whole explanation of ways in which we can start to do that in Scotland. And we need to do it fairly quickly because we have a lot of land area in Scotland. We've looked at how we can become more self-sufficient in food processing so that, again, we're at least able to say you know that what you're eating has been produced within a framework which says um, these have been produced in a sustainable, responsible manner. We can, we can ensure that for domestic production. You can't for international production. So I think that countries really ought to be more self-sufficient. I mean, I think that much more than degrowth, the crucial aspect to, um, to the climate crisis is deglobalization. We've got to start saying, if you can make it locally, make it locally. Be responsible for what you consume. Be responsible for how you make what you consume as far as you reasonably can. So we've actually in Scotland, again, a specific in Scotland is we are calorie self-sufficient. We produce as many calories as we consume. But unfortunately, the majority of the calories that we produce are actually barley for the whiskey industry. So you know, we have the potential to grow a lot more of our own food in Scotland. But there's another aspect of this, which is we expect to be able to have a wide range of foods all the time. And that's where the, that's where the globalization and import market has really led us to believe in the possibility of guilt-free avocado on demand. It's not possible. So just to say, we did some quick modeling of this and by our guess, we believe that you could produce about a quarter of Scotland's calories indoors in light assisted grow all year round for about the equivalent of £1.75 per person using current technologies, which are nowhere near over the efficiency hurdle. So, and you can grow anything. I, Iceland, one of my favourite places, we've seen how self-sufficient they are on fruits and vegetables that we can't grow all year round in Scotland. We need to start doing investing in this. We need to start growing, moving to large scale vertical farming as they call it. Um, because we are going to have to be able to maintain food security of a decent quality irrespective of what happens in the world. And it's food that is going to be the tipping point in the global environmental crisis. That's what's gonna impacting people most. Right, quickly, a few more. Land. Land in Scotland is badly managed. An enormous amount of it is massively overgrazed. We actually, embarrassingly for a country with our wilderness resources, our land is actually a net producer of carbon. We need to do all the right stuff. We've got ridiculously low levels of forestry 
for a country of our size. This is to do with our land ownership patterns. Scotland's land ownership is positively feudal. None of the rest of you have to deal with this. We have the most concentrated land ownership pattern in the world, and far too much of it is used for um, grouse shooting for the rich. It's a, it's a, Scotland's land is used as a hobby by wealthy bankers, and it's not good enough. So we need to plant a lot of trees, commercial and native broad leaf. Uh, we go into a lot about how we do that properly and well in Scotland. We also go through how we create a really genuinely diverse land ownership pattern for this forestry. We also go into the importance of rewilding. Our biodiversity in Scotland is it, it suffers and it shouldn't because we have so much land. So we explain how we go into the rewilding and we explain how we should create again, how we create the supply chains to how we go about achieving all this stuff. Okay. The next one is resources. Now, here we are pretty brutal because we really just want to see linear consumption patterns. It's the heart of the problem. We cannot exist like that anymore. So we've set out our model for a, a truly circular economy. And when I say truly circular, I mean zero landfill. Um, so I can't show yet because we did two versions of this book. The green one has all the numbers and all the detail, but we did another version, which is orange, which is easier to read for people who, who are non-specialists but are interested. Let's get pictures in it, diagrams. And one of the key ones that we've got in that is our description of a circular economy. So what we are seeing is, first of all, dematerialize, design with less material, consumer don't consume as much, design, design for environmental purposes, make everything reusable, repairable, recyclable. And, um, you know, in doing all of this, use a much narrower back palette of materials so that it's easy to disassemble, to reuse things. So all of that should be happening at the design and manufacture level. And then we just move into what we see as a loop system. And if you imagine this, each of these loops, you keep going around that loop until you can't anymore, and then you move to the next loop. And you keep going around that until you can't anymore, and so on. So loop one is share or borrow. If you cannot own it, don't own it. Share it or borrow it. If you can't share it or borrow it, the next loop becomes reuse it. Everything should be reusable. Nothing should be disposable. Um, if you can't reuse it, the next loop is repair it. We need to transfer our entire economic system from armies of low paid um, retail workers to armies of high paid repair engineers. You know, repair it, make it work. If you can't repair it anymore, remanufacture. So I'm sure you're aware, but remanufacture means take it apart and use its in component parts rather than melting the whole thing down and recycling. So remanufacture as much as you possibly can. If you can't remanufacture, this is the key bit. The key bit is we're really pushing, particularly for Scotland, because of our forestry capacity, because of our scientific expertise, we've got very good universities, we're really pushing alternative materials. So really, really advanced wood materials, bioplastics, and so on. Because what we're, what we're really saying is that Anything that you can't repair, it should compost, biomimicry. Most of it should return back to nature by itself. That, that's the key. And then only at that point do we get to failure. And what we, the way we phrase it is recycling is a failure. Recycling is a sign that you fail to use your resources properly. But it's the first response to failure. So if you have leftover stuff at the end of all of these loops yes it should be recycled but then it must go straight back in to the input stage again and manufacturers must be required to begin with recycled materials um, and real products we think you can get genuinely to something close to zero waste and if the world took this seriously i think the world could get to zero zero waste through these methodologies it would make corporations a lot less money and it would make people um, a lot wealthier um, and have a lot more good stuff in their life. Quality would increase. All of these things would be great. It's not a 
a win-lose. It's a win-win um, if we can get circular economics right. Now, the controversial one. I am. Um, we we thought or we thought it was going to be controversial, which is trade. This is when we start to say we cannot dump our problems on others. So if Scotland's lifestyle is zero negative impact in Scotland, but has a negative impact in developing countries, we failed. It's not right. We can't take that approach. And at the heart of this difficulty is globalized free trade. Globalized free trade is where you lose control over your impact. And I mean, if you look at everything I've said so far, it's all in our control. It's, it's all in the control of a nation state. These are our responsibilities. And then we get to trade. And in trade, you cannot trace the provenance or the quality of what's been manufactured, the vast majority of cases. You get what you get. And if you're lucky, you'll get an organic, you'll get an organic label in food or whatever. And if we allow that, if we permit that to happen, then trade will undermine efforts to tackle climate change. So what we've said is it's time to wake up to the fact that almost everything involved in international trade does significant damage, whether it's the production, whether it's the, the transportation of it, whether it's the consumption and then um, the, the disposal of waste, almost everything in that chain does damage. So what we are really saying is, we, if we're honest, we're not too faced, we've got to say the time for, well, we don't think carbon borders are enough. We've actually developed the basics of a model. We're going to work more on it next year for a full externality tax. We just think that it's time to start, you know, to follow through, make what you consume if you can and pay an honest price for what you produce. But if that is going to work, we also have to say, so make, pay the honest price for what you import the honest price for what you import. So we've got a full proposal for a consumer source and a consumer agency, which would assess all, anything sold in the shops would be assessed for environmental impact, health impact and social impact. And each of these negatives, wherever there's a negative, it should be costed and added to the price. And what we're saying is, <clears throat> obviously this would increase prices in the shops, but it's all a tax. They're not actually more expensive. We just tax them more. So what we're saying is all the tax revenue should be returned to people immediately in a basic income. So yes, things in the shops become more expensive, but you've got more money to buy them. And what that does is it simply enables responsibly made goods to be competitive. Right, the last couple I'll go through quickly. Learning I'll actually just skip. I mean, you probably know that you know, we've got to learn how to cook. We've got to learn, we've got to start teaching at schools, nitrogen cycles, carbon cycles, water cycles. We need to understand how and why we did the damage so that future generations don't do what we did, which was think there was, you know, there was no limit to what we could consume, no limit to what we could do to the environment. So we've got to get our learning right. And then we move to a section, the last one, which is very dear to my heart. And there's a reason why this is last. There's a reason why this comes at the very end of our list. And it's called us. And we start that section by repeating one more time. It's not your fault. Even if you tried really hard, you would still be creating an enormous environmental harm if you live in the Western world. It's not your fault. However, that does not mean that we can continue to live the way that we live and expect to fix these problems. There must be change. There has to be change. And this is where Commonweal brings a very specific perspective, which is we are all about positive visions for left-orientated futures. And I am personally really concerned about the way that some people talk about degrowth and that we talk about the future as being sacrifice, we talk about adapting to climate change as being us giving up things. And we just think this is massively, massively the long, wrong way to look at it. It's not about giving up 
It's not about sacrificing. It's about seeing in all of human history, there are a set number of human drives and desires. We want, we, we want to be warm and sheltered. We, want, we don't want to be hungry. We want to be fed. We want to be clothed. We want to have respect from our peers and in our communities. We want to be connected to other people. We want to give gifts. We want to find ourselves attractive. We want other people to find us attractive. We want to have hope. We want to have hope for our children. All of these things, all of these will exist so long as there are humans. But that does not mean that we can only meet them in one measure, in one way, in, in one approach. So what we are saying is, it's not about growth. It's not about bigger or smaller. It's not about sacrifice. It's not even about how much stuff we have in our lives. We've got too much stuff in our lives, but that's because of inefficiency, not because we've got too much stuff. It's about how we engage with all of this. If you have a circular economy, I'd love to talk about this because it's an obsessive subject. There's no time. If you have a circular economy, you can have anything you want. You just you don't buy it. You just rent it. If you don't, you know, most of the stuff that we have in our houses, we use for a fraction of their life cycle. You can have better stuff. You can have more stuff. You can have things that you've always fancied and you never had a chance to get. If we move from possession and ownership and, and disposal to sharing and renting and borrowing and accessing in other manners, we can have more, which is better for less, more money for us and more and less environmental harm. We need to start thinking in these terms. We need to start valuing ourselves, each other differently. We've got to get a grip in advertising. Personally, I'd ban it. It's, there's nothing good about advertising. Um, advertising is just a system of making you feel bad about yourself and then persuading you that you can shop your way out of your new dep newfound depression. Um, we've got to stop this. We've got to start stop saying this person is successful because they have things. And I always say, if your local doctor, your community doctor, pulls up next to you and she gets out of a sports car and you find yourself thinking, nice car, then you've missed the point. This person saves lives. This person will look after your children when they're sick. They'll look after you when you're sick. They will help you throughout your lives. Why is it that we value people on the basis of possession rather than contribution? We just need to get back. We just need to start saying, it's not about what you possess, it's about what you contribute. And to reorientate our, our social understanding of success and reward away from the 20th century obsession of measuring it purely in how much stuff you've got. And we've got to think individually about what matters and how we deliver all those things that every human craves. And put simply, we need to stop spending our money on things that we consume and start spending our money on participation, on leisure, on socializing, um, and, and crucially on relaxing. Relaxation is something that we shop ourselves out of in the Western world. And um, one of my colleagues puts it very nicely. You'll know that we are living in the society we should be living in when we see somebody at five o'clock on a Saturday laden down with bags from a shopping mall and we think, oh, the poor soul, what a terrible day. And we see someone else in our street coming home from a day, perhaps with friends or perhaps mountain biking or perhaps just lounging about in a spa, relaxing. And they've got that glow of relaxation and health and well-being. And we think, aha, good day. Whereas at the moment, you know, if you come back on a Saturday night empty-handed, you must have failed. And the person with all the bags had a brilliant day. This is not, we, we see everything upside down. We can be happier we can be healthier, we can be wealthier, we can have all of it if we could just get away from our stupid obsession with consumption. That is the big win. The biggest win of all, apart from saving the planet, the biggest win of all is saving ourselves from this stupid neoliberal model of chasing all, all the time consumption possession. That is at the heart of why everything's going wrong. Right. That is the web, the web through. Um, like I say, 
wherever you are, the solutions will be slightly different, majorly different, completely different. I don't, I don't know. Until you start measuring, until you start counting in the detail and all the bits of your world, um, until you start to try and do it comprehensively, he won't really know what the or I didn't, I didn't know what the solutions were. I learned more during this project than any other project I've ever done in my entire life. Um, if you don't start something like that, if you don't do a comprehensive plan and you start to count what that means, then you won't know the pattern of where we go next with it. So I'm just going to finish up with one last point. But what I really hope you take from this is that it's time to localize our responses to climate change. It's time to stop looking across borders and say, I'm only going to move as fast as the other person. And to justify doing that, to justify that hiding, we, we make this mantra that it's a global problem that applies global solutions. It's not. It's a problem for all of the globe that requires local solutions. And the more that we see it's global, the more that we are making excuses for not cleaning up our own mess. It is a localized problem. The nation state is the solution, not the market and not new technologies. Um, that being the case, how do we save the world? Because it's now clear as a bell that COP isn't going to do it. I don't know if you've seen, but just this afternoon, a report has come out which says that if everything that, they've, that people have said they're going to do at COP actually happened, we would still see global um, heating rise to the 2.4 degrees, 2.7 degree level. So that's what the IPCC is calling catastrophic climate outcomes. So at the moment, post-COP, even if everybody does everything they said they were going to do, and that's a big if, we'd still be facing global catastrophe. So it's not working anymore. This process of negotiating everything and moving as fast as the slowest is always Australia. Um, but moving as fast as the slowest, we can't do this anymore. So what can we do globally? Well, I have become increasingly convinced in recent years that we need to get away from this multilateralist approach. Um, obviously, I'm sure many of you will be aware that about 90% of Europe's nuclear weapons are stationed in Scotland. So if you want to talk about multilateralism, you're probably going to be talking to people in their own country because multilateral negotiations and disarmament will never disarm the world. And I've started to believe that multilateral discussions on climate change will never tackle climate change. So what will? My best hope at the moment is national leadership. That's what I think could possibly save us, which is to say, we're never going to be able to compel the global community because we don't have the weight or the power as citizens that the corporations do. We cannot vote for COP. We cannot, I mean, we can stand outside COP and we can protest and we can complain, but we can't compel, we can't really do much about it. So what can we do? Well, my hope is that we might be able to produce a model of what I've been calling, and apologies if I'm channeling George Bush here, um, but I've been calling coalition of the willing. Those who are willing and ready and able to transform their societies and their economies now cannot wait, cannot scale back. We have to do it. Scotland is at the forefront of this. There's almost no country that's better equipped for decarbonisation and environmental mitigation than Scotland. Um, we've got to get on and do it. We've got to start being not a host but a leader, a lesson giver, uh, a good example for others to follow. And there's other countries who have similar opportunities and similar public wills, and they've got to do the same as well. And we're going to have to create coalitions of these willing nations who are ready to make steps now, which have to be made. And that's not going to be enough. So the second part of what I think we're going to have to start talking seriously about is for the coalition of the willing to look at programmes of boycott, divestment and sanctions on nation states which could be doing things and aren't. So I think we have to think seriously about the, the possibility of coalitions of nations around the world um, who have made these commitments and who are producing their food in the right way and who are producing their goods in the right way and who are 
stewarding their resources and their and their economy in the right way and saying we can trade with these nations guilt free without worry barrier free um we can work with them to do all sorts of things but we cannot say that of nations who will not take the steps that they need to take so we need to stop trading with them we need to start sanctioning them and we need to start engaging with them because carrots are not going to shift this crisis globally we're going to have to start looking at some sticks and i'm afraid that in the modern world the citizen is the only person that will wield the stick and they can only do it at the nation state level and so we've got to work the best that we can from there upwards to create a global environment where those who are being left behind are not acting become international pariahs and are and and their citizens start to ask serious questions about what they're doing and how their future is going to operate okay i was supposed to talk for 45 minutes and i've talked for an hour i hope that gives you a picture of the work that we did the project um, as far as we can tell it's still the first comprehensive cost of green new deal for um anywhere that we can find in the world and like i say i think there's a lot that can be learned from looking at the process as much as looking at the outcomes i hope this has been useful and i hope it gives you some perspectives on how you think about what you do wherever you are thank you very much it was <laughs> i i don't know if people have um been, been able to follow this. I don't know how it went with the translation. There are no questions. I'm, I've never seen this before. <laughs> Either it's not functioning, our um, comment system, uh, our chat system, but I just, I don't see any questions. Well, um, we could either take that to be nobody came, no one's interested, or it was so absolutely clear and well articulated that um, that the, there was nothing that, that came up as a question. So I don't know. Um, well, I'll, I'll get to some questions. So we've had one comment. Everything was well explained. All right. <laughs> uh, Robert, let's start with what I think um, is the most important question is, all right, you, you're unique. This is really something very special. This is why it's, it's fascinated us, it's fascinated me for years. Um, what is going on in Scotland. You're publishing these. Uh, how, how is this being picked up? Ah, right. Okay. Well, here is the here is the difficulty, which is Scotland is, if I'm being quite sharply self-critical, Scotland is a bit of a greenwash, a center of greenwashing. So we tend to think we are good at environmental moves and steps and that we are world leading. But most of this is, is perception rather than reality. So, yes, we have a comparatively good economic, a comparatively good performance in decarbonisation. But frankly, it's hard to be Scotland and not have a good performance. I mean, it's almost impossible to have our renewable energy resources. Renewable energy, when, once you put a wind turbine up, it just keeps generating electricity. They're not even that expensive. It just creates so much electricity and it's so profitable that you don't really need to do anything. You know, you don't get, you don't, you don't, if, if we weren't among the best in the world, even by doing nothing, something very strange would be happening. So in Scotland, for quite a lot and plus we've set very good targets um uh, okay I, I, sorry i see some of the questions coming up now um if you um if you look at the, the the rhetoric in scotland we announced a climate emergency early we set very ambitious looking targets the problem is we haven't actually done anything we've set targets and we've just watched as wind turbines got erected because of the energy market but that's really all that we've done. So there is this assumption in Scotland that we are better than we are. And thankfully, that's now changing. So we are now seeing a lot more discussion about how Scotland isn't 
anything like as good as this as we thought we were. But there's quite a lot of support for it. And in Scotland in particular, as well as citizen support, as I keep arguing, because of our very lack, you know, we've got very low density of population. We've got phenomenal amounts of land. So much land in Scotland um, that, and so much energy potential that it's easy for us to do it. And I saw that, um, uh, Oh, there's so many questions there. I saw that someone said, I don't know how we do this in Germany. And this is the point, is that um, our renewable resources in combination with our low density population makes electricity generation for us easy. Um, I am instinctively anti-nuclear, but I recognize that, for example, if you were to supply the energy for the incredibly densely populated southeast of England, you're not going to do it through wind turbines. There's far too many people in far too small an area. Um, now, I reluctantly accept that there may be places in the world which have to look at some form of nuclear, and I, I really hope that's not true. But um, we're going to have to find ways to do this. And this is what I mean by um, it, it very much depends on your local conditions. You really have to look locally at where we are. So. In Scotland, we have the potential to do this. It's it, one of the things that frustrates me is it's comparatively easy for us. It's really easy for us to do this. And that's what makes our lack of action so frustrating is we could be miles ahead of this by now and we're not. So in terms of one of the, I saw as well one of the questions you say, what kind of levels of support have we got in Scotland? Well, you know the left and you know the environmental movement. Everybody's got their own solution. So you know, one group selling, pushing air source heat pumps, which we don't think work in retrofit. And another group's pushing, you know, uh, oh, we've just got to stop eating meat. And so let me put it like this. There's a very large volume of interest, but an awful lot of it in, in doing this, but an awful lot of it still remains at the stages of principles or broad ideas or hobby horses, to be honest. And so... We're at a situation where if any of this is actually going to happen, we need to do exactly what I titled this, this talk. We've got to stop yapping about principles and start counting the component bits of the system change we need to make. And what I would argue is if others come and go through the process that we went through of saying, right, what is it we're fixing and how do we do it? They'll end up in very similar places. I know two other individuals who did projects not a million miles different to what we've done, and they ended up in a very similar place. So there are sensible ways to do this, that if you follow sensible paths, take you in obvious directions. And that I think is how a lot of people will be able to get to a destination with this, which is there's only so many ways you can do it. And in any given country, any given place, there's only so many ways that make sense. So you just got to pick one of them and do it. Pick it, choose it, do it. So that, that's roughly what I think is the, is the position Scotland's in and where we are. All right, do you have an eye on the ch uh, chat? Well, I've been watching, I can answer a couple of questions. So for example, one person said, who funds the five billion pound cost? I went, I went past that very quickly because, like I say, it's so Scotland specific that I wasn't even sure if it would um, translate very well to wh whatever your country is. Um, I'll, I'll quickly explain how we got both sides of it. So one side of it was we had a series of techniques whereby we were able to cost what we were doing. So, for example, we know roughly the cost of retrofitting one average house to get it up to about 90% thermal efficiency. Now that's an average, so some will be above, some will be low, but we had a cost. We know how many houses we need to do, so we were able to produce estimates for that. We know how much it costs to put a ring main in for district heating. We know how much it costs to retro, to you know, fit the house. We know how much it costs to put the pipes in. So we were able to create a unit cost, which we multiplied by the number of houses. In other cases, it's been costed already, or in, other, in some cases, what we did was we took comparable, comparable schemes in other countries and scaled to Scotland. So it cost X amount to do 
X amount of district heating in Denmark, how do we scale that to what's necessary in Scotland? So that's how we created methodologies which gave us a reliable count of, of how much it was going to cost, which is where the 5 billion comes from. We are very aware of modern monetary theories and all sorts of other approaches that can be taken, but because we, we, there's, there's only so many dragons we wanted to slay in the one go, we thought that what we would do is take the very, the most bog standard European model possible, which is Keynesian type borrowing to carry out the work and then recover it. So what we did was we assumed that the five, and, and again, this is just technically if anyone's interested, we assumed that the five billion pounds would all be borrowed in day one, which obviously it wouldn't, but for the calculation, we then, made assumptions about what the long-term borrowing costs would be. So how much would that cost to service? And we assumed the 50-year um, payoff of the borrowing. So that was how we got the, the 5 billion. So every single, one of the things I didn't see is with our plan, every single person in the country would get their house upgraded to the top band of thermal performance. They would get a renewable heating system in and they would see a transition of the economy and it wouldn't involve them spending a penny from their own pockets. It would all be done. Every single penny of this would be done through collective public spending. And that was how we, that was how we scheduled the borrowing. Now, again, this is not how you would do it in real life. In real life, you would schedule borrowing over periods. You would, I mean, you would source borrowing from more than one source. You'd almost certainly use, you know, central bank policy to deliver amounts of the money and, 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 and various other approaches. So we, what, we, what we tried not to do was to get into it. And I, I, I'm not for a second saying a bad word about our lovely, lovely friends at the Green New Deal down in England who've helped us with this project. But they've kind of focused very heavily on how to finance it. So they've done a lot of work in quantitative easing for green work and, and, and how tax and these various models would be approached, which is all absolutely legitimate. But we really wanted to say, look, it doesn't really matter how you pay for it. We know that's not going to be a problem. We live in the cheap money era. Finding money is not a problem. The question is, how much is, do we need? To, and let's start to be serious about where we need to spend that money. So that was how, what we modelled it. And, and what we did was we just ran it through the standard economic model for the Scottish economy, made assumptions about supply chain capture and wage growth with some accurate numbers for all of this. And that helped us to calculate what the tax revenue that would result from all the activity would be. So that's how we got our numbers of 5 billion costs, 4 billion to service over, a, 4 billion annually to service over, 20, uh, 50 years and an income of um, about another 2 billion on top of that. Uh, so you would get the um, so 5 billion to service it, 4 billion in tax revenue, 2 billion in addition revenue. So our model conservatively suggests that it would cost 5 billion a year and generate 6 billion a year. Um, so it's not how do we afford uh, it's what do we do with the other billion pounds? How much support do we have in Scotland? Um, and civil society was one of the questions. This is where I get a little depressed, which is never enough. And a large part of the reason for that is this exactly this problem that people think we're on track. A lot of people in Scotland, you know, the Scottish government has been very good at its PR. It keeps saying the best climate change targets in the world anywhere. To which I say, oh, magic. Do you want to hear my, um, I don't know, my give up drinking targets or my targets for when I'm going to get the DIY finished in the in the in the other one of the other rooms in the house here? Targets are easy. So setting the best targets in the world is easy. We've missed almost all of the targets so far in the milestones, you know. And it's kind of like, well, congratulations, great target setting. We haven't hit, met any of them. We've gone backwards in some of them. So what's tended to happen is a lot of people have looked at our work and said, yes, we really basically agree with this. We would change this. We would tweak this. We would do that differently. Um, 
But now, and then we go back to the problem, and it's the problem with of government in the neoliberal age, is that everybody thinks you must start with what's there. So, yes, great, we do need to achieve X, but the current government policy is that we're going to do Y. So how can we do Y to the best form that we can? And this leaves me personally in a state of despair, I think it's the only phrase. So to give you an idea how idiotic that approach is, the official policy in Scotland at the moment is that we are going to get houses insulated in two phases. Phase one will make sure that every house in Scotland is insulated to at least band D level. And then phase two will make sure that every house is eventually insulated to band A level. And you put your hand up, you see, I know, but to get from band D to band A, you basically need to rip out everything you put in to get to band D and then replace it to get to band A. So why would you do it in two phases? Why would you install insufficient insulation and then come back a few years later, take it all back out again and put the right amount of insulation in? It's the kind of idiocy that the current, the current approach to government takes. And there is one other thing to say, and I won't go into it, but right now Scotland doesn't quite have all the powers it needs to do this. So as we, we are, we're a pro-independence think tank, but as I put it, as the book puts it, we're just telling you what needs to get done um, and how you would pay for it. It's up to each of you now to explain how your constitutional preferences would enable this to happen because none of this will happen so long as we are stuck with the UK's electricity grid pricing market. I mean, it, it won't work. It won't work if, if the Westminster still captures most of our tax growth, which it does. So how do we pay for it? It won't work if we've got we've very limited borrowing powers in, in Scotland under devolution. We can't borrow anything to do this. So there's many fights to be fought to get there. And my biggest fear is that we're going to spend another 10 years fighting the fights before we get started. And I am amazed every time someone says net zero in 30 years. So what? We're going to keep making it worse for another 30 years? And you think that's a sane approach to any of this? So right now, it's not going to happen the day after tomorrow. And one of the big problems in Scotland is that, and I just mentioned this and I don't want to dwell on it, but we've got an oil industry. They are lobbying like crazy just now to stop us doing green hydrogen and instead persuade us that we need to do blue hydrogen first so that they can use up the rest of their, uh, their um, fossil fuel resources and simultaneously own the hydrogen industry for when we eventually do go to green hydrogen. It's, 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 it's appalling. So let's not get carried away with the idea that Scotland is brilliant and all this. We absolutely aren't. We are, um, we are struggling to get the broad public support turned into intent. However, to be cheery on that, till I go down and find the next question, um, to, um, uh, to cheer you up, we held uh, another one of our pieces of greenwashing was that we held a major citizens assembly, 100 people selected at random to answer the question, how do we fix this problem? And they published a report in June, the final report, and it is very radical indeed, way more radical than the politicians. They completely bought into 100% our circular economy model. Um, they said that we should be opening resource libraries in every community, encouraging everyone not to own things. They had a, they went for a, they agreed. This amazed me. They, they agreed that we should move to a constant strategy of reducing imports and being more self-sufficient and high quality, um, um, sustainably and ethically made goods. So they're miles, this is, this is 100 citizens selected at random, and they're miles ahead of any political party or government in Scotland 
in radicalism. And that always gives me hope. Um, so another couple of questions. At the very beginning, I spoke of the seven uh, environmental crises. What are they? Now, actually, you'll, you can Google this. Oh, sorry. That was bad practice. So you can put this question into a search engine of your choice. Um, and you'll find that some people say it's five, some say it's seven, some say it's nine, some say it's 10. We found seven was probably the most kind of persuasive. And I'm doing this from memory and I've not looked at these for a while. So carbon, uh, atmospheric carbon, soil degradation, water management loss and accessibility and, and um, cleanliness, uh, material pollution, so plastics and other things, resource degradation, and um, uh, other forms of uh, other forms of uh, non-material pollution, primarily polluting waterways, particulate pollution in cities, these sorts of things. So atmos more atmospheric. So um, these are the these are the broad categories which we. Oh no, sorry, my mistake. Sorry, I've I've, I've split one in two. No, the two pollutions were one, so it's material and environmental pollutions. And the one that, of course, misses, missed was um, biodiversity. So biodiversity loss is the other generally accepted crisis. Um, so um, how do we engineer the toolbox of our collective mindset and growth and assets? Right. This is the section which I have probably got the most personal interest in, which is um, the engineering of the soul if we call it that. Um, the answer to this is that humans don't consume automatically. We, we have to be made to do it. So if you give somebody, and this is the, sci the neuroscience, the psychology of it, if you give somebody a day off, by default, they will spend it with their children or relaxing or maybe going out drinking if you want them to spend it in a stinking can i swear a stinking fucking shopping mall sorry if i'm not allowed you actually have to spend a phenomenal amount of money twisting their heads to persuade them to go and do that the amount of money that's spent in advertising globally each year and I, I i do a whole other talk about advertising which i despise well i love it and i despise it it's such a wonderful creative art to be used for such evil purposes. Um, but I do a whole different talk about this and I do uh, an exercise that I suggest people do, which is get hold of a notepad, a pencil, whatever, and sit in front of a commercial television channel that's got advertising on it. And every time an advert comes on, just write down quickly what you think you were supposed to take from the advert and then look at it at the end of the night. And your pad will say, your hair looks shit. Your boyfriend, so girlfriend, are kind of ugly. Your car's crap. Your house is too small. Your food isn't cool enough. You're not cool enough. You smell. Nobody likes you. Shop. <laughs> That's roughly it. That's a night of advertising on a standard television channel. And I keep saying, well, let's imagine that we just had a situation where for every two minutes of advertising, you had to have one minute of anti-advertising. And that would consist of each advert break finishing with one minute of very gentle clouds rolling by and a pleasant voice saying, your hair looks good, your boyfriend's lovely, your house looks nice, your car's fine, your clothes are great, your food looks dandy. Stop worrying and enjoy your life. And if we had that message, half as much as we've got the message that you will be a failure and you will be laughed at if you do not own new things, we would shift this around quite quickly. But I'll also point out that I am fundamentally a social structuralist. And the answer is if you create the capacities and facilities in society to enable people to do the right things, broadly they'll do the right things. So I'll just give you one example. If you want people to be active and participate in communities without creating waste, then start putting in place 
inexpensive, easily accessible night classes. Half of the people that I know would love to learn a language or to do interior de design nighttime classes or to learn car mechanics or something like that. It's so, so difficult. You can shop and it is so frictionless to shop and it is so friction filled to do a night class or to join a gym or to these things they are the more provision of them there is the more that we tend to do that in any case but we've just got to start saying the what was it it was a quote by thatcher not my favorite person but at least kind of do respect the fact that unlike current leaders she kind of did what she said she was going to do she said she was going to fuck the unions and she did so um, i kind of i kind of kind of respect that in her at least and she said something that nobody in the left would have the courage to say and i think i've got this quote exactly right but what she said was um transforming the economy is the tool the goal is transforming the soul and she was that was their mission and she won so much she transformed the soul of the people of Britain from a community in 1970s to an acquisitional, acquisitional 1990s. She transformed it and she did that by a program of action. Now, nobody in the left has the nerve to even say that we want to engineer the human soul because we're also scared of it, cultural revolutions, Mao, all that crap. The right are still saying it. The right are still in the market to get your soul. But the left is so scared that if we suggest such a thing, everyone will run away from us, that we never admit it. We need to re-engineer the human soul or return it to where the human soul was before um, the advertising revolution of the 1920s and, and the, the way it's transformed our expe expectation of everything came along. So number one, create the roads that take you to the right place and then you'll find that people take those roads and end up at the right place it's not complicated we're just too scared to take on the interest there's a question in german um uh sorry i'll translate it for you very quickly yeah. which yeah. groups do you have to get together uh to create uh, common plans. Ah, right, this is a nightmare. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's not, it's not with ill will. Um, it, it's not ill will. It's just that people feel about this subject so strongly. I mean, they feel so passionately about it that it can be quite difficult to get some people to lift their heads up above their own thing. So I, I, this is just a personal comment, but the way that we did it is in the team we divided up different sections among the policy team and different people worked in things and i am our lead on there's a quite an active um food coalition trying to get a change in the food system in scotland we are partners in that and i'm the rep on that so i took food and it was by far the hardest section to do simply because everybody agrees that something needs to change but we work kind of equally with vegans, you know, groups that would advocate veganism, as we do with small agro producers. So the small agricultural, you know, small farms that use integrated systems with, for example, you know, mixed grazing to act as fertilizer for soil, you know, all, all these kind of things. So the vegans don't agree with the small producers, the small producers don't agree with me or they, they, they're suspicious of me and my suggestion that we need to grow a lot more indoors and in controlled environments. I mean, the pollution impacts of that alone are so positive that we should be considering it. And it's an example where we discovered that everybody wants to achieve exactly the same thing and everybody's got pretty diametrically opposed ideas of how to go about it. So the, the, the small agroecologists will tell you that the vegans are causing mass deforestation to produce, to plant soy monocrops. Um, whereas the vegans will give you all the statistics about beef production and its impacts on the environment and so on and so on and so on. So it's really quite tricky. 
the, there isn't a there isn't a single answer. I mean, what I said was it will come down to a small number of options in each case, but there's still decisions to be made. Um, you know, there's 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 still leadership required, and that in the end is where I've kind of got to with this. We've been trying to work using soft power for ages. Um, we've been trying to um, get adoption of these among the political parties. And the Scottish Greens really just about lifted half of our, no, three quarters of our work in their manifesto. Um, but the problem is we don't actually have a major political party, which is a contender for serious power, which is really standing on this platform at the moment. And that's what I think we're lacking. I, I think that a government that was serious about taking on, basically, I think this is about taking on globalization. Um, which has got nothing to do with internationalization, nothing whatsoever to do with it. Um, it's just a new form of imperialism, and I that I think is the that I think is the key. Somebody is going to have to stand up and say consumption isn't the solution. And I haven't heard us, I have not heard a single politician with the nerve to suggest that we need to reduce our consumption. Not, not in power, not a government politician. It was completely absent from COP. I was only in COP one day, but I looked around and I saw one mention of sustainable consumption, and that was from a supermarket. Um, I, I do not see the political leadership which understands this is a system problem and not a... You know, they seem to think we can retrofit our existing economy to make it run on, you know, cleaner fuels. It, it, it won't, it can, it, it, it's the general approach, which takes me to the, the point someone here made in, in the German about, um, uh, if, if I'm saying it's all just engineering, will not bring about the change. So I mean, I read, and, and I should read George Monby with this stuff, I read George Monby all the time. What I'm saying is that the practical realities of fixing this stuff is largely engineering. If you look at where the money is spent, 90% of the money that you would spend in climate change is, is physically doing things. You know, it's not, it's not incentivizing or giving grants, it's, it's physically doing things. And that's what I mean by it being a major um, engineering project. But I cannot say this enough. Just look at history. Engineering changes society, not the other way around. So I, I'm just going to give you a little example of this in the town. I, I stay out in rural Scotland, about um, 40 minutes from Edinburgh. And if you look at the town in which I live, you can identify big social periods, big eras of economic history by the physical makeup of the town. So first of all, we have a high street, and the high street is very... Um, grid oriented, and very linear. And that's because it started out in feudalism when the way that it worked was you had what was called in Scotland the run rig system. So you had a cottage and a long strip of land that went outwards behind the cottage where you um, worked on an almost self sufficiency model and then gave a proportion of your produce to the feudal landowner. Now that model has defined the physical reality of my town until you suddenly realize there's a great big wide high street and this is the early mercantile era because we were a we were a a rural market town where um goods were bought and exchanged in the open market and that, that's because our town was then shaped by the era of the free market and then we were, you can then look at the, some of the key buildings in my little town, which came from the Victorian era, when this idea of collectivism, the municipality, the, the provision of art galleries, museums, and town halls, and meeting places, and libraries, went hand in hand with the whole idea of ex accelerating capitalism. And that's, the legacy of that is right across the town. And then you can see the thing that's obvious about it now, which is a trunk road goes right down the middle of our high streets, turned into part of the trunk road. And that was the age of the car, the age we're still living in. Everything is shaped around the car. Everything in our societies 
physically shaped around the car. Now, in each of these cases, these were physical changes, which related to the society that was making the changes. But in every case, the way that we lived in our town was shaped by these physical realities, by these engineering interventions. So, you know, the, the Women's Rural Institute or the Sewing Bee or the Amateur Dramatics Society, they all exist and meet in, because of that Victorian era and because they engineered buildings in which you can do these things. Um, you can... Um, you can look at the way that our town is now lived in and it's a fast transport hub right through the middle. People, you know, it's, it's right in the road from the north of England to Edinburgh. And that has shaped how we relate to our town, how we live in it, how we behave in it. So what I, I cannot say enough that when I say it's mainly an engineering project, yes, but that doesn't mean that the outcomes are primarily about engineering the things that you do are engineering what i'm trying to strongly suggest is that an advertising campaign saying recycle more is futile and pointless and a waste of time and we shouldn't even be considering that as a crucial part of the toolbox for taking on this fight but i am clear as i can possibly be that at the out run of this at the end point of this process once we've done that engineering, it must, it will have, it must have changed our society, changed our expectations, and changed our individual values. But what I'm suggesting is those will change more easily if we give them a structural chance to flourish than if we give them the marketing shove um, you know, that's the, the standard in Western governments, which is another television advertising campaign encouraging you to eat a little bit less meat or whatever. We, that's, we're way past that point. So it really is largely an engineering um, project, but I can't say enough. Engineer the real world, engineer the person that lives in the real world. And that's really, that's really at the heart of this, is give people the capacity to live in different ways, and they will live in different ways. It's the no choice at the moment. You know, we have no choice but to live in this hyper disposable consumerist society, and we can fight back against it a little bit. But everything is geared against us. You know, everything is pushing us in the wrong direction. We can engineer a different approach. Isn't there a huge hydrogen scheme being undertaken in Scotland? Um, Right. So this is funny because, um, yes, there is. There's two different, well, there's a few different things going on. Number one, we do have um, an onshore plant, which is doing proof of concept, kind of scale, renewable, green hydrogen, but it's not commercial scale at the moment. And I'm afraid, I don't think we're, I don't think we've been ambitious enough. We should be scaling this up much faster. So then we've got an offshore scheme, which is the one that I think is our big opportunity, which heartbreakingly, of course, is a an, Norwegian an corporation, which is funding it. Another key lesson is Scotland doesn't own anything. You know, we really are the most foreign owned economy in the world, of, of the developed world, as far as I can tell. Um, certainly, the UK is the most foreign owned of the major economies, and we are way more foreign owned than is the UK as a whole. So the problem is that we don't invest in this. We just hope to go, you know, we just hope some angel investor turns up in Scotland and does it for us. But by far the most insidious element of this, and I've got to be careful what I say here, one of our energy team is an academic who is Scotland's leading energy hydrogen expert. And let me just put it like this. The work which was carried out by Scotland's Economic Development Agency on hydrogen looked quite different from the final report, which was at the last minute co-produced with the oil and gas industry. So I think that probably gives you the indication. Hydrogen is a massive, is a massive fight in Scotland. We can drop subsea turbines, stick them onto an electrolysis plant and produce entirely green hydrogen now. And, you know, 
the cost of that is just the capital cost. It produces endless free hydrogen afterwards. Or we can produce blue hydrogen, which is a lie anyway, because it relies on carbon capture and storage, and carbon capture and storage doesn't work. So it's a, it's a lie anyway. But what they are saying is, oh, um, pre-combustion um, pre -combustion separation of petrochemicals can produce hydrogen and easily catchable carbon dioxide. No, it doesn't. That's not true. It's not easily capturable. It's capturable, but it's expensive. So this is the fight that we've got. The oil and gas industry desperately wants to slow down the shift to green hydrogen because it wants the market. And it wants the market for those two reasons that I mentioned. First of all, it wants to really um, exploit every last ounce, every last gram of oil and gas in the North Sea. And then afterwards, it still wants to be the prime hydrogen market. So it owns the, the shift to green hydrogen as well. As for Scotland's position, you can call you can describe green hydrogen as what to do as, as just excess electricity. It's really what it is. Any electricity you don't use, run it through run it through water, and you get green hydrogen. So you can kind of argue that green hydrogen is just a measure of how much excess energy you've got. And <laughs> this is my point. This is totally nationalistic from my perspective. It's, it's brilliant for us. We've got more excess energy than anybody. I mean, per capita, we've got way more excess energy than any country I can think of, apart from possibly Iceland, in terms of clean energy. So we can just really, really sink bucket loads of the, you know, of, of subsea turbines and power as much green energy, uh, hydrogen production as we can. And my strong suggestion is, now, I'm going to give you away my wee secret here, which is, if we do become independent, we'll, of course, eventually, probably, be negotiating to re-enter the European Union, at which point the big lesson is if you want to join Europe, it's best to have something that Europe really, really wants for the negotiation purposes. Now, we could quite easily, we don't even have to bother with interconnectors. We could just quite easily say, right, brilliant, we're going to have these oil rigs all across the, no, not oil rigs, but these rigs, electrolysis rigs, right across the North Sea. We just send out hydrogen tankers to load directly from them and ship them wherever that we want to. And this is why I believe that Scotland could become one of the, I mean, Scotland should become the world's leader in green hydrogen, certainly in its initial development phase, just, which should be. If we don't, we should really all just take a, a walk out in the back garden with a revolver and just don't come back in again because we've just blown an opportunity which is so, so enormous because Whoever it is that really masters this, well, they'll get the technology learning as well. You know, it, technology is something that you learn when you do it, not before you do it. So we would have this massive technological advantage as well. And I'll just point out that the scope of what we could do with that is enormous. You can extract atmospheric carbon dioxide, combine it with hydrogen and produce synthetic aviation fuels. There's so much that you can do um, with this resource. So yes, we're doing some hydrogen schemes in Scotland. No, they're not huge. Yes, it's very, very promising. No, I'm not feeling optimistic about it right now. But yes, the gap between doing absolutely nothing and being a, a genuine world leader for Scotland is that much. It's that much. It means take on oil and gas, get them to fuck, Sorry, my language is awful. I'm Scottish. Get rid of oil and gas altogether and then just become the leader in green hydrogen. Because as, as someone points out, in Germany, you're going to need all the electricity you can get hold of to decarbonize, you know, clean energy. In Scotland, we don't even know what to do with our electricity. There's so much potential for it. Um, so that would be, that. I mean, that, that's the answer. Is, as with so much in Scotland, there's this giant possibility and there's this tiny little reality and there's infinitesimally gap between the two of them and standing right in the middle between each is the bloody oil and gas industry, such as corporate power. 
And the last question that came in there, I, it's in German. My German is dreadful. Or it's a comment, maybe. You're, you're, you are muted. If there's any um, reading material you could recommend, do show your book you had at the... Uh, okay, at the so again. this is what I would suggest is, like I say, you'll probably browse this quite quickly because the specific content is for Scotland. It wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to just lift and shift all of this to where you are. Uh, in the chat up higher up, the website name's there. I'll just put it in again. Uh, so if you go on there, you can buy a hard, oops, sorry, I spelled that wrong. You can buy a hard copy of the book or you will find there's a digital download. So you can digitally download either version of the book um, for free. So we're not, we don't, we don't, we're not in it for the money, as you can tell. Um, so that's where you can get that information. As for what to read, well, this is an intre beyond that, this is an interesting question. And I was quite surprised by what I learned, which I see with a lot of this stuff, there isn't, there's less literature than you might imagine. So there is endless literature from the kind of left environmental movement about why everything's wrong, why we've got to fix it, what the problems are, and what I would call the broad generic responses. So, you know, you'll find plenty of stuff of saying, we need to change agriculture, for example. Now then you say, brilliant. So I've read my book, chapter, whatever, on why we need to change agriculture and what the principles are by which we should change it. From where now can I get the details of how to go about it? Now, what I ended up doing there was a, we found an academic in Glasgow University who's everybody recommended to me is probably the leading expert in Britain on assessing the impacts of an agro of shifting to an agroecology system. So I went, spent two hours chatting to him and he gave me a copy of his book. And the big lesson was, sorry, mate, nobody's done the work. And I was quite taken aback by this, but it's genuinely the case. You can go and find endless, well, not endless, but there's a fair literature, for example, on how you go about changing an individual farm from industrial agriculture to um, agroecology. But you'll find all sorts of things keep cropping up if you do go and you do this reading, which is that they always did it on the basis that they would become a niche specialist market. And therefore, for example, they would be selling to niche purchasers, a niche uh, consumer market on the basis of a premium being charged on the agricultural produce. So what that means is you can tell how to shift a farm to agroecology, but we don't have it. There's no nationwide, economy-wide example of shifting from, agro, from industrial agriculture to agroecology. And one of the minor, minor arguments I had with somebody in the food area was I kept saying, look, it's okay productivity will drop a little bit, but that's okay. I mean, if productivity drops a little bit at the price for saving the planet, I mean, that's okay. It just creates more jobs and it'll just make food slightly more expensive. And he was adamant that there would be no productivity drop. And he sent me all this literature on how people who've shifted to agroecology managed to get about the same final yields from the same... Uh, area that they farmed. I said, oh no, that's fine. I accept that the yields are the same, but in every case, the workforce was slightly larger. So, you know, they, they, were, they were seeing a 50% increase in the workforce to deliver the same yields, which means the productivity's come down. That is the bit where I cannot recommend quite as much reading as I should. So it's the, it's taking, it's getting away from the small specific to the large systemic, where you can take 
learning points from it. There's not half as much literature in that as it is because very few people have done it. There, there's very few large scale shifts to mass pesticide reduction in agriculture or to large scale circular economy or you know, so on and so on. And this is real implications because we don't know what it looks like a lot of the time at system level. We don't know what it looks like if you take an entire economy and try to move it away from consumption towards participation. We don't know how much resistance you would get from human behavioral change. We don't know what kinds of investment are required. We don't know the scale of it. We don't know how much people would stick with it and roll backwards again. Um, we don't know much because we haven't done this yet. And that was one of the things I slightly skipped over just because time. But in the section that I was talking about in learning, we actually had a second half of that section. And what we said was, if Scotland actually did this, we would be generating so much new information, so much data all the way through it, that we would really need to set up an international center of excellence and research and innovation on climate change mitigation. Because we would be starting to generate information and data and knowledge on what actually happens when you do these things at a system level, what technologies are developed, what changes come in place, what barriers do you face and, and so on. So in terms of finding out what we did, everything's free, it's on the website, um, you can get it there, no difficulty. In terms of where did we get all that information from, there's a, it's not in the book actually, you'll find in our policy library, um, we tried to keep this as user friendly as possible, so we avoided the million references front, you know, endless footnotes and whatever. We put it in a separate technical document for anybody who really wants to understand how we priced what we think the production cost of hydrogen in Scotland is. Um, so you can find some of that information there. Uh, that will also point you to some of the sources that we used, but the simple answer is we are as a species of civilization, we're doing something we've never done before. This is new. This is a, a wholly different process to anything that we've done in the past. And like I say, you can make it, you can treat it as analogous to the massive civil, civic engineering projects of the Victorian era that gave us, you know, railway lines and sewage systems. You can compare it to the massive post-war reconstruction in Europe after the Second World War and the arrival and the emergence of the nation of the welfare state, you can compare it to the, the, you know, the Roosevelt New Deal of the 1930s and uh, late 20s and 30s. But in truth, it's, those are very loose comparators. Those are very loose um, ways of seeing this. This is new and specific and of its sort. And this is one of the reasons why we're going to have to crack on and do this because somebody is going to have to get through the process of the trial and error of actually doing it and then be able to provide useful, meaningful, macro level evidential statistics to others who come just behind that on how it works, what it means, and what it's going to mean for the place that you live. So, I mean, again, if Scotland had one contribution, well, the two, well let, let's pick two. There's two contributions. Oh, let's pick three. Three, con sorry, sorry. I, can't, I know, I know. I get carried away. If Scotland was to pioneer externality taxes and to greatly, and, and to pursue an import substitution, green import substitution, reindustrialization, one of the clumsiest phrases in the realm of economics, but absolutely crucial. If we were to reindustrialize as a manufacturing nation, making much more of what we consumed on a biomimicry basis, that would be a massive contribution Scotland could make because it would tell you a lot about what that shift looks like. If we could really pilot and implement an externalities tax to be able to observe consumer behaviors when buying good things and buying bad things isn't a cost difference, <clears throat> that would make a major difference. And if we could just bite the bullet 
and take the pain because it is pain you know first first um first movers in these things have to go through the pain to then get the benefit of the pain they've gone through but if we were to go through the pain of trying to crack the technologies around maximum maximally efficient green hydrogen those would be three enormous contributions scotland could make to the world but then again anybody who decides to do this anybody who decides to make a system change and who gathers the data and makes it available to the world will be doing the world a very very big favor indeed so um i hope i hope that's a gift scotland can grant the world um we will see but i look around the world oh i don't know on an almost weekly basis in the hope that somebody else will make that lead so that we can follow them and it's not happened yet so i'm quite content if it is us who's who's first to do this uh, i really hope it is because like i say scotland has so much potential for this so much potential to do this well that it would be we should feel shame if we don't scotland's future generations should be let's assume there are future generations um, Scotland's future generations should look back at this generation and condemn us outright if we don't make this first move because we are prime prime position to do it. Robin, thank you very very much for stopping because the interpreters just fell over. Uh, <laughs> Sorry interpreters, Mona, Florian, you've been amazing I'm sure. I don't know how you cope. Anyway, thank you very very much. I just want to remind everyone next talk is on the 24th of November, Julius Steinberger, physicist, but um, also very, very worth uh, listening to. And then once again, we've started our fundraising campaign. This is rather important for us. So if you, you know, can get around to donating, it would be greatly appreciated. Robert, thanks again. We'll be chatting soon. Yes, everyone. Good night. And thank you to I'm not supposed to name them, but um, you already did. Thank you to Mona and Florian. And thank you also to Frank Engster, who sort of runs all this. All right. See you in a few weeks. Bye.